Here's another question for you this evening. If your house was on fire, what one thing would you save? You'll be familiar with that kind of question, I'm sure. It comes up from time to time, often to find out what we consider to be truly valuable or precious in life. So after making sure family and pets, of course, are safe, if your house was on fire, what one thing, what one item would you grab? What one thing could you not afford to lose? It might be your phone. It might be a laptop. It might be a computer hard drive. It might be the television or the games console. Or maybe a photo album. Or a family heirloom of some kind. Jewelry, a watch for instance. Perhaps a musical instrument. A wedding dress. It's an intriguing question. What in our lives do we consider to be truly valuable? Well, the truth is, everyone here this evening, everyone in the houses around about here this evening, they have within them, they have in their possession something that is of greater value than the whole world put together. We have within us, friends, something of greater value than the whole world put together. That's the truth that lies behind this question this evening. And surely there's no more important question than this one before us. After all, the person who asked it was the most important person who ever walked the face of this earth. It's a question Jesus asked What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? To to put it another way, what advantage would it be to you should you gain the whole world but lose your soul? It is a penetrating question, friends. It's It's a searching question. It's a question that ought to ring in our ears and challenge our hearts. I do believe there's nothing more important for each of us to think about this evening than the state of our soul, the present condition of our soul, and the eternal destiny of our soul. So let me make Four observations from this question this evening with you. Firstly, all of us have a soul. All of us have a soul. Every one of us, every living person in this whole world possesses a soul. Uh, We all carry within us something that will never die. And of course, there are many today who mock that idea. And they say, well, you're just a collection of cells and atoms and molecules. You're just physical matter. Uh, There's nothing more to you than what you are physically, materially. But, oh, friends, we are much, much more than just physical beings. We've been set apart. We've been made differently from the cats and the dogs, from the badgers, from the pigeons, from the camels, and yes, the chimpanzees. We're different because we are body and soul. Body and soul. We can love. We can make sacrifices for others. We can think of the past and the present and we can anticipate the future. We can make conscious decisions. We can be moved by the beauty of creation, by music, by literature. We can contemplate the sun, the moon and the stars. 
We can know God as our creator, as our sustainer, as our redeemer, because he has made us body and soul. We're told at the very beginning, when God made Adam, he breathed into Adam's nostrils and man became a living being, a living soul. And that, friends, is what established us us as being made in the image of God. That's what makes us as different from every other creature. So let's establish the fact in our minds. We're more than mere physical bodies. We have a soul. It speaks of the place where feelings come from. Desires, affections, reason. It's the spiritual part of us. The immortal part of us. It's the part of us that lives on even after our bodies stop All is not over when the doctor makes his final call and when the last breath is taken, friends. The soul lives on. Each of us would do well to to take this to heart because we live in a world which is so taken up with the here and now. A world fixated on the material and the physical. And there's hurry and bustle and business on every side. It's so easy to get caught up in it all and to fall into the trap of thinking, well, this world is everything. Of thinking the body is all that's worth caring for. But Jesus, in his question this evening, is making it clear all of us have a never-dying soul. And we have something within us that is more valuable than the whole world put together. So you might be poor in this world. But you have a soul. You have a soul. You might be sick and weak and riddled with disease. But you have a soul. You might in worldly terms be a nobody, but you have a soul. And that's what God is supremely interested in. It's the most important thing about you. You have a soul. A minister from the 1800s, a man, John Ryle, once said, the first step toward heaven is to find out the worth of your soul. To find out the worth of your soul. Thank God if you feel that this evening. That's the first thing to see from the question this evening. All of us, we have a soul. But secondly, let's think, it's possible to lose your soul. It's possible To lose your soul. And given the extreme value of our soul. This is an extremely solemn thing then. The notion that the soul is something we might lose. It can be lost. That's the idea behind Jesus' words. Forfeiting your soul. Losing your soul. Well what does that mean? To lose your soul. Your soul. Well the scriptures are clear. Uh, The state of your soul. The condition of your soul. uh, Determines your eternal. And everlasting destiny. And if your soul is safe. You will go to eternal and everlasting glory. If your soul is safe. But if your soul is lost. You will go to eternal and everlasting misery. That's the difference. And so let me say it plainly, friends. There is one place to which the lost soul can go. And that is hell. Hell, a place of blackness and darkness 
a place of wretchedness and utter despair, the place Jesus described where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's where the lost soul goes. But how does that happen? How can we lose our soul? I mean, surely that's an important side question this evening. Given the importance of the soul, how is it that men and women, boys and girls, young people could lose their soul? Well, a number of ways it's possible to lose your soul by poisoning it, by destroying it, by strangling the life out of it. Many, many people today fill their lives with ungodliness. They fill their time with adultery and dishonesty and greed and deceit. They fill their bellies with alcohol. They fill their lungs with nicotine. They fill their veins with heroin. All of these things, they're out to destroy your soul. So it's possible to lose your soul that way. But my friend, it's also possible to lose your soul by doing nothing about it. By doing nothing about it. We live in a day when people spend a fortune, quite literally, on pampering their bodies. Going on special diets, checking into spa resorts, employing personal trainers. They'll run to the doctor. They'll go privately about the slightest, the slightest physical problem. But they'll do nothing about their souls. They never think of their soul. Now, I'm not saying that we should neglect the body in any way. But it's getting priorities right. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. Bodily training is of some value. But godliness is of value in every way. As it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. So it's possible to lose your soul by sheer neglect, friends. Never forget the one thing that is need needful. Never forget you have an immortal, never dying soul. It takes nothing to ruin it. It takes nothing to lose it. You could just yawn and think about something else this evening. You could just look at the drawing your child is doodling. You could admire the architecture of the building and consider your own private business. That's all you have to do. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming with the tide. Floating with the stream. Going with the crowd. And soon the opportunity of saving your soul could be gone forever. It's a downhill journey. Losing your soul. It takes little conscious effort. And at the end of the day, who will be held? Ultimately, who will be held responsible for the loss of your soul? No one but yourself. In hell, there's no one to blame but yourself. The blame will lie squarely at your own door. So I can't think of a more critical question this evening. How is it with your soul? Why are you not thinking about this? So all of us have a soul. It's possible to lose your soul. Thirdly, there's no greater loss than the loss of your soul. There's no greater loss than the loss of your soul. I think we all know what it is to lose something. We could tell story after story, I'm sure, of things we've lost, uh, our reaction uh, to losing whatever item it is, it's closely related to how valuable it is, isn't it? Uh, how we respond, it's closely, it's correlated to how valuable that item is. A few years ago, when our, when our family were on holiday 
and the north coast, we lost our car keys. We couldn't find them. One of the children had been playing with them. That was the first mistake. Never let your children take the car keys out of sight. And later on, when we needed the car, the keys were nowhere to be found. That child was too young to question and interrogate. Uh, And for hours, we searched high and low for these keys with no joy, no success. And it consumed us. It was all we could think about. You know what it's like to lose something of value, and it just consumes you. And that feeling of disappointment and despair and regret, it nearly overwhelms you. Well, friend, that's nothing compared to losing your soul. To losing your soul. Any feelings of regret or despair over a lost phone or or lost keys, that's nothing. That's nothing compared to the eternal regret, the eternal despair in hell over losing your soul. Make no mistake, to lose your soul is an infinite loss. It's an eternal loss. Because once lost, it's lost forever. Sometimes after great searching, we find the things we lost You'll be glad to know, months after we lost the car keys, months, we unexpectedly found them. Literally the day after we got a new set of keys cut, we found the car keys. No one who has drawn their last breath can ever retrieve a lost soul. So there's no such thing in the Bible as purgatory, some kind of mythical holding place for the soul where it can somehow be purged and redeemed. Not at all. Once lost, the Bible teaches we are lost forever. So what an incalculable loss we're, we're dealing with, friends. Incalculable it might be. Nonetheless, Jesus, it seems he wants us to picture these things. He wants us to weigh them up, as it were, to do an internal audit, to balance the books. And so with this question, Jesus places before us a pair of scales. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Imagine, Jesus says, that you gain the whole world. A pair of scales, and on one side, place the whole world. So everything valuable, all the diamonds of Africa, all the gold of Australia, all the oil of Saudi Arabia, all the pharmaceuticals, all the electricals, all the agricultural wealth in the world, everything valuable you can think of, it's on that side. The whole world, Jesus says. Nothing left out. Unimaginable splendor. If you can Think of it. If you can describe it, it's there. Cars, cattle, yachts, books, industry, property, glory, riches, honor. It's all there on this side of the scales. And then on the other side, Jesus says, place one single soul. One soul. It might be the soul of of a child, perhaps. Or it might be the soul of a person with learning difficulties. Or it might be the soul of some old Chinese peasant woman who has spent her life sowing and harvesting rice on a hillside in in central China. One far-off, distant soul, that one soul. Outweighs all that the world can offer. And it so outweighs it that it's as if an elephant has been placed on this side and there's a little mouse on this side. Jesus saying the whole world cannot begin to compare to the value of your soul. Have you reckoned with this, friend? 
that if you were to gain the whole world and in the process lose your soul, you would have made the worst of all possible trades. The worst of all possible trades. There's no greater loss than the loss of your soul. Nothing in the world can rival the value of your soul. And if you're still uncertain about the value of your soul, consider for a moment the price that was once paid for men and women's souls. After all, there was once an enormous price paid for souls. I'm not talking about the transfer of money or silver or gold or precious stones. I'm talking about the precious blood of Jesus. Nothing less was needed. And can we not see something of the value of our soul when we think of how much Jesus was willing to pay for the souls of his people? He left heaven to live and suffer and die on this earth because he knew the priceless value of your soul. And even when you were neglecting your soul, even when you were set on poisoning your soul, he laid down his life for your soul. And he turned his back on Satan's offer. There was a time Satan came to Jesus. He offered Jesus the whole world, everything on that set of the scales. He said, Jesus, you could have all the kingdoms. If you don't go the way of the cross, just you bow down to me, Jesus. Jesus turned his back on Satan's offer for the sake of your soul and mine. He could have had it all, but he gave his life as a ransom for your soul. Such is its worth. Such is its value. And as we think of these scales before us, friends, the incomparable value of our soul compared to everything else life could offer us. I do think there's a word here for when it comes to loss. When it comes to loss, whether physical, material, emotional, if you live long enough, you will suffer loss. Some here this evening have suffered enormous loss. Whether that be in terms of family or friends, health, reputation, a business, a home, we'll all suffer loss of some kind or other. Is Jesus not showing us though here? Even if we lose everything, even if we lose all that is near and dear to us, the main thing, is it not, is the condition of our soul, the state of our soul. It's something a man called Horatio Spafford knew something about. He was a successful attorney, a real estate investor. He lost a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a holiday would do the family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them. He had some pressing business to take care of. <coughs> However, while crossing the Atlantic, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sank. Uh, more than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. And when she arrived in England, she sent a telegram back to her husband that read, Saved alone. What shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. And at one point during the voyage, the, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy, 
He summoned Horatio to, to tell him they were now passing over the spots where the collision had occurred and the shipwreck had taken place. And as Horatio thought about his daughters in that spot, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind. He wrote them down. They've become a well-known hymn. You'll be familiar, many of you, with these words. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And that's in this question, isn't it? Even if we should lose the whole world, the main thing, the main thing is the safety, the well-being of our soul. Is it well with your soul this evening? Out of everything else we might lose, there's nothing more dreadful than the prospect of losing your soul. So we all have one. It's possible to lose it. There's no greater loss than the loss of the soul, but I cannot leave things hanging there this evening. I must not leave things there this evening. The fourth, the final consideration. Anyone may have their soul saved. Anyone may have their soul saved. And that's the message of the gospel. A message that concerns the salvation of our souls. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And anyone here from the youngest to the oldest may know this evening the salvation of their soul. Now, I cannot save your soul. Now, there isn't a single person here this evening who can save your soul. There's no angel that could come from heaven this evening to save your soul. Only Jesus Christ himself can save your soul. He suffered and died on the cross to take away our sin. The righteous dying for the unrighteous. He died to deliver your soul. To purchase your soul. To save your soul. And if you should end up losing your soul. You should know it's not because you could not be saved. It's not because there was no pardon for you. It's not because there was no open door for you. It's because you insisted on your own way. It's because you would not come to Christ that your soul might be saved. It's because you kept going the way of the crowd. It's because you kept on freewheeling downhill. Learn this evening there is pardon for the greatest sinner. There's healing for the sickest soul. There is salvation in Jesus. And I wonder if even still some are determined this evening to live for the here and now. And as things stand, your soul is lost. Your soul is lost and you're under the condemnation of God. And you're traveling downhill to hell and eternal wrath and judgment. And you are intent this evening and you are persisting to sacrifice your soul. And yet God has brought you here and he's placed me here to stand as it were in the way this evening to plead with you to repent of your sin, to turn to Christ and to trust him as your saviour. 
I make no apology in saying this evening, my heart's desire and prayer for you is that your soul might be saved. And if you value your soul, I invite you, come to Christ without delay, that you might be saved. Lay hold of him this evening. Why not? Why not? Why not today? Why not before the day ends, turn from your sin and trust in the Savior? Why not go to Christ this very evening, casting your soul on him with all of its sin, with all of its doubt, with all of its fear, with all of your questions, cast it on him. Think of the value of your soul and come to Christ that your soul might live. Amen. These are important things this evening. Let's come to the Lord in prayer together as we're able. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have made us body and soul. We thank you, O Lord, that we know, we know deep down within us that we have a soul. Lord, we thank you for the picture before us this evening, this set of scales showing us the exceeding value of one soul. Lord, we're one soul this evening to find salvation in Jesus Christ. What rejoicing there would be in heaven over one soul. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. There is a way for things to be well with our soul. There is a way that though we should lose the world, our souls could be safe. Our souls could be settled our souls can be found in jesus christ lord may we be given the faith to be able to say of that man of old it is well it is really and truly and eternally well with my soul in jesus name we pray amen Psalm number 49 speaks of souls being saved. Psalm 49. We're going to be singing verses 5 to 10. We're using the tune in the books 2, 3, 9. The portion begins, verse 5, with the impossibility Soul's redemption costly is. Money never could buy this. You could never buy it. You could never buy the redemption, the salvation of your souls. And the, psalm, the, the portion goes on speaking of rich people not being able to do this. People who have bought a lot of land not being able to do this. Uh, but then verse 10. One of the great buts of the Bible. Verse 10. But God will redeem my soul. He will surely keep me whole. God will redeem my soul. We sing these words to God's praise, 49 verses 5 to 10. Let us praise God together.